Recording in prog. ¿Listo? Ok. Hola, buenos días. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias por estar aquí en esta reunión, en esta sala, en donde después de ese meeting tan interesante donde están conociendo ustedes a los Faculty of Excellence de distintas escuelas, pues ahora es el trabajo con cada una de las escuelas. Y este ejercicio para la Escuela de Medicina y Ciencias de la Salud. Entonces, pues eh, la idea es que ustedes escuchen una charla, en este caso, de uno de nuestros Faculty of Excellence, que es el doctor Richard Wilson. Eh, lo va a presentar el doctor Marco Rito, al quien supongo ya conocen. ¿Quién no conoce al doctor Rito? A ver, alce la mano. Entonces, todos lo conocen. Eh, él, pues como saben, él está como director del Instituto de Obesidad y pues es el líder de los grupos que actualmente pues coordinan el trabajo de nuestros tres Faculty of Excellence, que por cierto, 
que están aquí también presentes. Entonces, este es el momento en que ustedes tienen para poder interactuar directamente con ellos, preguntarles lo que quieran, preguntarles quiénes son, lo que no se atreven a preguntar así cuando termina la sesión, eh, muy de cerca. Interrúmpanos, ya vi que está muy altote, no, no le teman, este, <ríe> acérquense con él. Entonces, pues bueno, doctor Rito, adelante por favor y muchas gracias. Gracias Luis, voy a decir algo en, en español y luego cambio a, a, a inglés. Efectivamente quisiera tomar lo último que dijo eh, Luis, dividimos la sesión con 40 minutos de presentación, pero dejar tiempo suficiente para la interacción. Entonces no es típica presentación de 10, 5 minutos de preguntas y respuestas, sino esa es la oportunidad realmente para preguntar no solo cuestiones de ciencia, sino cuestiones de, de carrera, de retos que ha encontrado en, en su vida. Uh, con eso cambiaré a, a inglés. For me, it's really a great pleasure to introduce Richard. Uh, Richard, I will say, uh, more than a colleague, it's a friend. We have been known for almost 20 years. So, um, and we have, I think, shared several uh, similar challenges in, in, in the academia. So the Richard, it's, uh, as Luis mentioned, a faculty of excellence, particularly in the area of uh, early detection. So it is really um, very relevant, the talk uh, of, of Richard. It's supposed that I have to, to introduce with a CV, but I always would like to say that Richard does not need an, an introduction, but I will do an attempt. Uh, the number of publication is more than, than 200, uh, index factor above 40, several recognitions. So for as a tech and as a school of medicine, plus the Institute for Obesity Re Research is really a great pleasure to have Richard as a collaborator. So perhaps without any further delay, uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much to each of you for that kind introduction. Um, so, you know, I'm going to talk about point of care and portable diagnostics, and I, I thought it sort of gives a certain credibility if I can bring things to you and give them to you and you can play with them. If you got one of the pregnancy tests, I urge you to open it up and just have a look, take it home, and uh, you can use it, right? Like a scandal, right? <laughs> um, if you're a man and you use it and you come up positive, which a drunk guy at a party did a long time ago, he'd actually diagnosed himself with a rare cancer. So again, if you're a male and you come up positive, that's not to just joke about. You need to get to your doctor right away. Statistically, the odds are very low that that will happen. But take it apart and look at the pieces, because I'll, I'll talk about them and show you pictures, but there's nothing like really seeing it yourself. Um, and I'll refer to some of the, the other things as we go along. So I am going to talk about the thing that made home immunoassays famous, which was there we go. Oh, and I should emphasize, this is a team effort, right? It's very much between the University of Houston and tech. I haven't even listed everyone here, though this was getting awfully long. But you know, Marco, my senior person, Caterina Corenzi, uh, Mirna, who's here, Alex, our MD, PhD, essential collaborator, um, Bin Vu, my sort of chief technology guy, Margarita Ortiz Martinez, who's been spending a lot of time in my lab, um, Austin Hahn, who works with me, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, it's a large team effort. And I'll refer to some of the parts as we go along. Um, I also want to emphasize that technologists and physicians should talk more often, right? Because the technologists are full of all kinds of interesting ideas, and the physicians have problems. That is, they, they own the problem, they understand the problem. But, you know, some of the worst days of my life have involved sentences like, oh, yes, very interesting that you can measure that so sad there is no clinical actionability of that result at all right so listen to the physicians ask them what really actually matters to them and this is part of the whole sort of product market fit customer discovery thing in entrepreneurship too so i'm going to begin by talking about pregnancy tests in a weird way um just to talk about the history because this is where you know lateral flow tests really became popular um it used to be a long time ago that if you wanted to see if someone was pregnant you might dip a urine, sorry, dip a ribbon in their urine and burn it. And if she was nauseated by the smell, she was pregnant. 
which sounds crazy, but isn't entirely nuts because, of course, you know, women often have a very low threshold for emesis, and they're probably protecting the fetus, etc. Um, more recently, there's a thing called the rabbit test. Okay, so now there's some science here. This is a bioassay for the pregnancy hormone HCG that appears in the urine. You can inject it into the rabbit if the rabbit, and it turns out it works across the species boundary between humans and rabbits. And so if you see ovulation by cutting the rabbit open, right, um, then the woman was probably pregnant. There's even an old movie called The Rabbit Test about an unexpected pregnancy and that drives the plot of the story. Um, pretty hard on the rabbits, fairly laborious, etc. But a legitimate scientific test. There, there was another one with frogs as well. So then we got antibodies, right? We knew a bit about antisera, et cetera, for a long time, but we got monoclonal antibodies. We could begin to use those in assays. And so you will all know this, but I'll just remind you that antibodies, you know, this is the canonical IgG1 shape, are shaped like a Y. They have the FC down here, and then they have two binding sites for whatever antigen you're interested in here and here. And we are now capable of making them to bind almost any target uh, I will mention just in passing that they're now a major class of medicines uh, in the U.S. where we have direct-to-consumer advertising. It is very common now on television to see a commercial that comes on, usually in the evening. And first, it lists 20 terrible side effects, death and your hair will fall out, et cetera, et cetera. But then it promises a medical miracle. And then the product name is always blah, 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 MAB. It always ends in MAB because it's a monoclonal antibody. And these are a tremendous advance in medicine, um, but they're also an enormous business. I mean, sales are more than 200 billion US dollars per year. But just to illustrate, I mean, you know, there really is an, an Alzheimer's prophylaxis from Lilly after some early misstarts. The one from Lilly looks like you might actually really want to give that to lots of people. And there was a paper, I think it was in Nature a few days ago, suggesting that there are pretty good predictive biomarkers for Alzheimer's. So you can easily imagine an environment in which you're occasional testing turns up one of these four biomarkers or some panel thereof, and they start giving you this monoclonal. Uh, manufacturing capacity will be a real issue uh, if, that, if that gets widely adopted. Um, there was a, a time when people would talk about witches, right? Who was a witch? Almost always a woman who lived independently, older, maybe not completely compliant with societal norms, but she was always shown as having scary hands like this, right? Well, that's not, you know, demonic possession, that's rheumatoid arthritis. And now we have monoclonals that pretty much prevent the horrible scary hands problem, right? Which is a rotten disease. An old friend of mine from high school days has rheumatoid arthritis and her hands are perfectly normal because she has the modern drugs. Six of the top 10 selling medicines in the world are monoclonal antibodies now. But I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk about their use in diagnostics. So how do you detect things once you have an antibody that binds, well, the classic format is the so-called sandwich immunoassay. And again, most of you will know this too. You have a solid surface of some sort, commonly the well of a microtiter plate, the 96 well plate, and you put the antibody down. It doesn't go down nicely like this. It crashes on there and gets partly denatured, but it's still functional. And then you have some target. The capture antibody can capture and bind the target, and then you add another antibody which can bind at the same time to form a sandwich between the two antibodies. And this second detector antibody has a label on it. And I want to emphasize that we never actually detect the target, right? What we see is the label. And so my lab spends significant effort, and I'll tell you a couple of stories before getting to our current collaborative project, about making better labels to make these kinds of assays better. Now, that's drawn as if it were being done in a microtiter plate. Um, the, the new format, the thing we're going to talk about today is the lateral flow immunochromatographic assay. I've been interested in immuno for a long time. I've been interested in chromatographic for a long time. And more recently, we've done an awful lot of work in immunochromatographic assays. And most of you will know this too. And this is why I recommend you open up that pregnancy, like take the whole thing apart either now or later. But the parts are like this. There's a sample pad on which you're going to apply whatever your sample is, right? In a in a pregnancy test, that would be a raw human urine. Um, then there's often a conjugate release pad where the detector antibody and the label conjugated together are sitting, waiting to be swept up by the tide of liquid that comes along here. For quantitative assays, you commonly don't do this, but for a yes-no assay or semi-quantitative, it's fine to have the so-called conjugate release pad. And then 
if the target is present, it will bind to the detector antibody and flow along here, and that pair will be caught on the test line by the detector antibody to form the sandwich I showed you earlier, right? So this is solid capture antibody, target, detector antibody, label. I've drawn it here as little gold particles because gold nanoparticles are common. Amusingly, those look to be red. They don't look to be gold. Um, they can be polystyrene latex or other things that we'll talk about. And then there's essentially always a control where the particles will be captured, the detector will be captured independent of the presence of the analyte to make sure that flow has occurred correctly. And I want to note I want you to notice that there are four pieces here, right? Sample pad, conjugate release, the, the main membrane, and the absorbent pad that sort of drives the flow by, by sucking up the liquid, and they overlap. And the reason that the, 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 the black thing that I'm handed around, those are our, those are our cassettes. So we have those injection molded for us in Hyderabad by the thousands and thousands and thousands. They're dead cheap, but they're very carefully engineered. I, I peel it apart. I put them together in a way that they're loose. You may have reflexively closed them, but if you haven't, you can easily peel it open and look. And you'll see that, that places where there are these overlaps, uh, there are frequently uh, pressure uh, applying um, uh, asperities on the, on the cassette to sort of squeeze these together, but not too hard. Right? And we actually iterated with 3D printing and expert consultants to, to get it right for a test we were working on for COVID. <clears throat> so it's an amazing technology, right? Untrained person under high emotional excitement, either positive or negative, uh, can perform a test for a, a protein hormone in a raw urine sample with a sensitivity of a few nanograms per mil, and I can have them delivered for less than one USD by Amazon to my house, right? It's a remarkable technology. <clears throat> so what, what's not to like? What would you change? Well, the first is that a few nanograms per mil is sometimes not good enough, right? Uh, for in, some infections, for example, I mean, notoriously, the COVID-19 lateral flow tests were not as good as the COVID-19 PCR test, right? So the sensitivity wasn't that good. Uh, my daughter has twice been a false negative for flu by lateral flow and therefore not gotten the drugs in time. And, you know, nothing terrible happened, but she was sicker for longer than she needed to be. And then the other is quantitation. Um, if your goal is to tell the difference between zero and sum, LFA is generally fine. But if your goal is to tell the difference between a number I'll call two and a number I'll call five or four, then the quantitation is a challenge, right? And many biomarkers, including things we're going to talk about today, you need to tell the difference in a quantitative thing where the normal background is not zero. So our bright idea, a terrible pun, is that we can make the particles light up and emit light so we can see them better and we can quantitate the light, et cetera. And I'll tell you briefly two of those that we've worked on because the stories are fun and they give you a feeling for how this kind of thing works, but also to sort of show what, we've, what we're sort of bringing historically to this, this current project. <clears throat> so the first one was, can we use glow in the dark materials, right? So, you know, many of you will have seen these. Uh, my, my daughter, who, to whom I probably refer too often, uh, was quite young. I was putting her to bed. It was dark in the room. I was thinking a lot about detectable labels for lateral flow because that's what nerds do. And the only thing I could see in the room was the glowing stars on her ceiling. Right? So I took one of those stars off of her ceiling over her objections. That star currently lives in a frame in her room. She got it back again. Um, and I took it to my really excellent graduate student, a guy named Andrew Patterson. I said, Andrew, what is this thing? And it turns out it's material called strontium aluminate. And I'll, I'll demonstrate strontium in two ways. This is a big chunk of strontium aluminate that I've had you know, lit up for a while. Um, now, we have to grind this stuff down to 300 nanometers with a ball mill for a couple of weeks. We have to size fractionate it. Strontium aluminate is reactive with water, not ideal for a biomedical label, but you know, we, can, we can coat it in stober silica and it works out fine. Um, it's also wavelength dependent a little bit. So this is a piece of paper that, I guess I should do this so you guys can see it too. This is a piece of paper that's coated with strontium aluminate. And red is, is you know, longer wavelength, lower energy. Not much happens. Even green, shorter wavelength, is very bright for humans because we are very sensitive to that wavelength, but not enough. But with purple, you get the finger of God, right? It's just a, a lot of fun. Um, and notice it fades pretty quickly. And it turns out, I won't go to the details now, but it, it fades quite quickly at the beginning and then slower later. It's not single exponential. And so you have to be quick to shift between illumination and imaging if you want to do this with maximum sensitivity. And that actually drove us to go to smartphones because 
Originally, we would light them up under a light, take them out, put under a gel documentation camera, and it was pretty good, but not fantastic. But when we switched to software, so we could put it in a phone and use an app to switch between illumination and imaging with a fixed 100 millisecond offset, which is the shortest time that an Apple could do reliably, um, it got great. It really improved a lot. So <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to talk about is glow stick chemistry. And you guys should all have at least one of these things now. <clears throat> so glow sticks are a clever technology. Many of you will have seen them also in children's toys. I seem to work in found objects from children, right? Um, and so if I take this and bend it, I'm breaking an inner glass tube, which contains a liquid. And then around that glass tube is a second liquid. And when the two liquids get together, they do, oops, oh yeah, sorry, we're not there yet. Um, they do a reaction which makes an activating chemical, which is a strange cyclic dimer of carbon dioxide. It's the world's most unhappy molecule. The trick is it can bump into a fluorescent molecule and chemically excite a fluorophore. So many of you will have done fluorescence imaging. You have some ideas about fluors in lights and stuff. And those are always photon excited. That's how a real-time PCR machine works, right? It has a, an optical excitation. The challenge with that is if you want to do this at home or in a really cheap environment, which is our big goal here, um, especially for a lot of our other projects, <clears throat> you can't afford the optics, right? You can't afford monochromatic wavelengths, uh, you know, light sources. You can't afford nice interference filters, the heart to multiplex, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a way of generating <clears throat> multiple colors with no optics. And the only difference among these sticks is that they have different fluorophores in them. They're all using the same excitation chemistry. And I'll show you later, we can, we can use that same excitation chemistry for multiple you know, multiplex imaging uh, in, in lateral flow. <clears throat> so for phosphors, we ground them up and coated them with silica and made them 300 nanometers and suitable for lateral flow, and they work fine. Um, we, we have apps, we have app people. By the way, this is my call. Um, no one in this room is relevant probably, but we would love to have some bright uh, mechatronics people from tech to come and work on smartphone apps for this sort of stuff. I'm probably going to lose my really excellent guy in that space and we will be short. Uh, and I would love to have visitors from tech to do that sort of thing. I suspect there's a lot of expertise in this campus, probably in groups different from this one uh, for that sort of thing. <clears throat> but you know, it, it fires the flash. It may fire it more than once. It may use the torch. Um, it can switch, as I said, to imaging really quickly. We commonly take multiple images and stack them to reduce statistical noise. And then we do simple image uh, analysis to find the lines and do numerical integration to get the brightness. And then we commonly, and this is standard in the field, we ratio the test line and the control line to each other as a way of normalizing for things like variation in brightness or flash, et cetera. We've actually made a whole study of the variability of phone flashes. They're pretty good if batteries are high. Um, and I want to tell you one story of application here. Uh, and it's also a good example of, of working with physicians. I have a, a really brilliant collaborator named Chandra Mohan. He's an MD, PhD. We stole him from UT Southwestern Medical School, which is an excellent place. He's a rheumatologist and he's very interested in lupus. Lupus nephritis, nasty progressive disease tends to um, statistically over afflict the less privileged in our society. Um, and uh, the, the, a big compl complexity of, of lupus is you may eventually get nephritis, right? You may get kidney inflammation. You might even get kidney loss. And losing the kidney is commonly, you know, the antecedent to losing the patient. Um, so the way that, that, that people with lupus are diagnosed is potentially having nephritis, which is treatable. I mean, there are things you can do if you diagnose it and catch it early. Just they, they wake up in the morning, they're feeling bad. Do I have the flu? Am I hungover? I didn't sleep well. Maybe I have lupus nephritis. They go to the doctor. And the physician uses the best available technology. They take a big hollow needle and they stick it in their kidney and pull a piece of meat out and look at it, okay? Patients will do that one time, okay? And patients do not consent to serial repeating of that assay. Um, and it's laborious and awful and invasive, et cetera. So Chandra had the, the great insight. He's very good at finding biomarkers in things, in blood, et cetera. He had the insight, well, kidneys make urine. Let's look in the urine for biomarkers that can discriminate between uh, active lupus, inactive lupus, uh, lupus nephritis, other kidney diseases, healthy controls, et cetera. And by virtue of great efforts, 
he identified several markers actually. And we, uh, we wrote an NIH proposal for this. We got a one, um, nobody ever gets a one. I mean, somebody told me they would build a religious shrine to me because I had gotten a one, <laughs> but it was just a perfect collaboration. We had a really good technology. There was a very clearly defined medical societal need for this technology. And he had the biomarker that made our good lateral flow platform really applicable to that problem. Um, I'm not gonna go into much detail, but I just wanna give you a feeling. It's, it's a long effort, right? I mean, there's a lot to do. I'm not gonna read these things, but you know, I can whip you up a lateral flow in a couple of days, but if you want a reasonable, useful, you know, defensible lateral flow, we, we might be talking a, a year or two, right? It's a long time. Um, one of the things we have to do is screen a lot of antibodies. People will come to us and say, hey, I want a lateral flow for this. Here's my antibody pair for this. And I'll say, that's great. Bring me 20 more antibodies. And they'll say, what? Horribly expensive. And then I'll say, yeah, yeah. And we're going to screen all the combinations in all, in all arrangements because some antibodies love to be on membranes as the capture. And some antibodies love to be on particles as the detector. And so when you get big matrices of the results where all you've done is flip the positions, they're not symmetric around the diagonal, right? It's, we have pairs that are terrible in one way. You just invert the positions and they're great. And the other way around. Um, so again, more detail than I want to go into. You have to worry about sort of, you know, quality control things. We at one point were running a quality system in my lab for other reasons. So reproducibility, can you make the thing in multiple batches? You know, academic groups have this tremendous ability to, to do something really neat and they can do it nine times out of 10. And then they meet someone who wants to talk about scaling that. And that pe those people start talking about doing it correctly, you know, 9,999 times out of 10,000. And that is a transformation in how you do things. And it's horrible. <laughs> we maintain quality system in the lab for a while. And, you know, it's just not very compatible with the exploratory, rather low consequence academic environment. But if you're gonna move into medically regulated products, at some point, you have to get sort of that level of seriousness. Um, I don't recommend it as the first step. So lots of batch to batch reproducibility, stability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it works. I'm not gonna go into this in much detail, but you know, those of you who know how to read uh, AUC curves, you know, we, have, we have a test that actually quite nicely discriminates between healthy controls, inactive lupus, other renal diseases, and active lupus nephritis. And the AUC looks pretty good. You know, Probably the way to do this is with multiple markers, whether our current marker Alchem ends up being even in that panel, not established. But I think we've opened a clear path to people testing themselves once a week, once a month, just to see how they're doing and avoiding the kidney biopsy and still getting very timely capture of their, of their problem. So I mentioned Andrew Patterson, very bright student who did the, the original work on the phosphorus based, uh, the phosphorus based um, lateral flow. And so he and, and a, another very talented student of mine named Bala Raja, Bala's an unusual guy. He's a genius from IIT uh, Delhi, I think he's from. We get great students. Um, and um, he's also a semi-pro boxer, which is a super unusual combination for somebody from the subcontinent. And uh, they said, we should commercialize this. And I was excited about that. Um, but at that point, I was serving as Associate Vice President for Technology Transfer. My father and my son are both patent lawyers. I'd done some startups. I'd been on the IP committee. I had put my predecessor into the job. He'd left. Um, and uh, at that time, U of H, as a non-medical public university in the United States, had the largest patent royalty income in the United States of any university in its category. We had a couple of good drug patents. And uh, it was an exciting activity, but my predecessor, as I say, left the job sort of overseeing it as, as associate VP, but it was okay because the vice president was taking care of it. But the VP reaches out to me and says, hey, could you fill in six months, 50% effort, you know, just, just help out a little while we make the transition to somebody new. And I'm, you know, sure, happy to help out. I'm interested in this area. Um, <clears throat> you know, let's have a meeting. I have some plans. I want to spend some money. I need your vision. You know, I need your permission to do some things. Sure. He cancels the meeting. Okay, so we reschedule the meeting. <clears throat> he cancels the meeting. Okay. We reschedule the meeting. He cancels that one. He's inpatient at MD Anderson Cancer Center and he dies. So, you know, and a mighty tree falls on the campus and there's chaos. But in my case, I was literally walking into people's offices saying, hi, I'm your new boss's boss. 
what is it that you are doing here? <laughs> and it was a horrible scrambling. It didn't last for six months. It was not a 50% effort. It was a chaotic mess. And also it gave me enormous conflict of interest because my office controlled all the patents and all the licensing and you know, was, was the thing that incubated little startup companies. I launched a startup incubator building. I recruited the first staff and the first tenants of that building. I ran the, the seed fund, which we gave money to startups. Um, and so the conflict of interest was horrendous and I was horribly busy. I mean, I was probably at risk of getting divorced or disowned by my child at that point. So I said, well, I, I just can't play, right? I just come out, can't come out to play, you do it. So fine. And then um, they, we filed the IP. We, I got somebody else to run the gap fund competition. They won, they got some startup money. There's a thing called the Houston Angel Network, which is the largest group of angel investors in the United States. There's a lot of sort of crazy, you know, risk tolerant money floating around in Houston, from, mostly from oil people who made it rich. Um, we got into a thing called the NSF I-Core program, which is designed to help you understand where your technology might fit and actually have value. The big problem for technologists is they have cool technology and they misjudge where the best value application of that technology is. So I highly recommend if you're interested in entrepreneurship at all, look up this I-CRPS. Um, <laughs> we, we found ourselves, so I was part of the I-Core effort, uh, and we found ourselves wandering around in downtown Los Angeles talking to people who didn't look like us and were way less privileged than us and much less fancy dressed than us saying let's talk about your chlamydia problem here <laughs> which is super awkward <laughs> uh, but it turns out you know home test chlam for chlamydia would be a really useful thing um and um so the company was sort of starting up and then they got into y combinator so y combinator is the sort of legendary strange silicon valley incubator um the guy who runs open ai now used to run y combinator uh, Air, y Combinator gave rise to Airbnb, Dropbox, and Stripe, for example. Um, so they were thrilled. So they said, well, we're not moving into your lab incubator building. We're going to Stanford instead. We'll pay 10 times as much, but you know, we'll be in Y Combinator. So they went off and did that. They worked really hard. They had a good demo day. They got an investment, a couple million dollars of VC from a, a famous venture capitalist, Vino Kosla. Then they set up a little company in a small space in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, and they were working on, you know, let's develop this home test for chlamydia. And they were having some trouble raising money. I told them, you know, someday a female VC is going to fund you guys, right? Because disproportionately affects. Um, but they were struggling. And then all of a sudden the COVID-19 ferry appeared, right? If you had a really good diagnostic technology, uh, there were opportunities. <laughs> so they managed over time to grow to 120 people. They raised 38 million non-dilutive dollars, I mean, gifts from the federal government. They scaled, they got FDA emergency use authorization approval. Uh, then COVID went away. Then the FDA most removed the goalpost for their next product. Then they're sort of crashing, but it appears that they're actually about to be resurrected. So there's a whole crazy story there, um, but, but a wild ride. And I'm, I'm very proud of what they've done. <clears throat> so this is my required disclosure statement because I have an interest in this, but you know, this is, this is a product they actually got EUA'd. This is the, the next device. It's a triplex for uh, COVID, flu, and RSV. Um, and we'll see who actually might bring that to market. There's interesting possibilities floating around there. Um, the other thing is the glow stick that I mentioned before. So you break the inner glass container. It mixes two liquids together. If you haven't done yours, I urge you to crack your glow stick. This is the chemistry, something like TCPO, some oxalate and peroxide forms. This strained cyclic dimer of carbon dioxide, look at that miserable molecule, right? A four-membered ring. And if it gets to split, it gets to be carbon dioxide, which is a very happy molecule. And this can chemically excite some, but not all fluorescent molecules. So these sticks differ only in what soluble fluor is in one of the liquids. So we, uh, we worked on this. Uh, we, we got a, an internal <clears throat> COVID grant. Well, let me finish the story and then I'll go back to that. Um, we, we actually looked to see what solvents we should use, which would be not toxic and not smelly. It turns out there's a database called the, the Good Sense Company, S-C-E-N-T-S, that tells you how stinky chemicals are, uh, which is kind of interesting if you're designing a product that people might use. Um, and we, we, made a, a very nice, we made a very nice lateral flow out of this um, with the possibility of, of multiplexing. And this was the idea we would use not soluble floors, but standard fluorescent particles of the sort that would be used in a standard fluorescent lateral flow test, which exists out there and has fancy optics for reading it out. And we would run the thing 
and then apply the glow excitation liquid. This was the quick thing we could do during COVID urgency um, and make the things light up or later have a reagent blister built into the cassette where you would press the button that would squeeze the liquid out. And um, this, was, this was working pretty well. In fact, we got this grant from the NIH under their RADx program, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics program, RA and then DX for diagnostics. And they said, oh, you guys are really good. You're the, you're the second most, yeah, you're the second most sensitive lateral flow in the RADx program. I said, that's great, we're very excited about that. But being, you know, gluttons for punishment, who's number one? Oh, there's this crazy company out in Silicon Valley called Luminostics. What, Andrew and Bala? <laughs> so we were in direct competition with our own people and we were number one and two for a brief magic moment. I doubt that we are anymore. There's no, a lot of technology development in this space. So anyway, we are, we are continuing to work on this. Um, we didn't bring a COVID product to market this way, in part because, you know, it was too early. There wasn't enough time. They didn't give us money. We're academics and didn't really know how to do that very well. Uh, and the, the the wealthy captain of industry I brought in as our CEO uh, was diagnosed with stage four melanoma in the middle of all of this. Um, weirdly, on the bottom of his foot, a place where sun does not hit very often, and surgically quite treatable, it was on the heel. They did a big excision of the you know that area, treated him with modern monoclonal antibodies, and at the moment he's fine. So uh, a good outcome, but very disruptive to company efforts. Um, and we we you know we have apps and and attachments and stuff like I showed you before. The multiplexing works pretty well. You can, you can take three kinds of particles. And so, for example, you know, there's no red here and there's no signal there. There's no blue here, there's no signal there. Green gets some crossbreed, but you can correct for that in certain ways, you know, digitally if you need to, to some extent, it won't be perfect. Um, and it works pretty well for COVID. I mean, we could, we could see samples up to, you know, PCR confirmed CTs in the high 20s, which was much better than, than most things. I want to just say briefly, we, we built a pretty good little factory. Um, so we have uh, the sort of the, the lowest level industrial device for making really high quality strips. We estimated we could make a million a year if we had to, um, although we would almost certainly contract out to one of the various manufacturers. We have a laminator that puts things together. We have a guillotine cutter that's a lot of fun to watch that cuts the strips. It was actually on television a while ago. We got interviewed by a local television station. They wanted something visually interesting. <clears throat> so. Those are great. They give that sort of the background is my credibility in this space, if you like. But neither of those was ready to roll out immediately for commercial deployable clinical application. And so for the project we're working on at tech, we're using a more established technology. We didn't want to didn't want to have a situation where people were dependent upon an academic lab or a crazy little company in Silicon Valley to get large numbers of their of their reading instruments. And so we're using an industrial thing, industrially standard thing called a europium chelate particle. These have nice fluorescence and there's some long lifetime aspect to it that allows a time resolve reader to read them very sensitively. And they have a big stoke shift, a big difference between excitation and emission. So they're very good fluorescent reporters. Um, the readers are a little more expensive. I mean, we're trying to do something that's $2 on top of your existing smartphone for the other technologies, but here, this is not going to be a home test kind of thing we're talking about to be done in a setting point of care point of need where there can be some investment. And so one of the readers that we're interested in is a regulatory mature this, this has been approved by regulatory authorities is the ESE quant and then I'm going to tell you a couple more devices we've also used more recently. Um, and so our goal is to build something around this we 3D print little trays to put strips into and there's a bunch of details, but it works really nicely. Um, and so this is the project out of the bioengineering and medical devices unit here, joint with all the people that I mentioned on the on the first slide. And the topic is called lateral flow platforms for the early detection of metabolic disorders and obesity protein biomarkers in children. And this has uh, a tremendous, you know, sort of obvious application, the kinds of things that motivate the Institute for Obesity Research, because obesity is a gigantic problem here in Mexico. It's a gigantic problem in Texas and really around the world. Um, Mexico particularly has a lot of, of childhood obesity, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, don't need to dwell on this too much for this group. Um, and so the, the, motivating, the motivating idea from our clinical folks is that childhood obesity is currently described mainly on body mass index, but could you sort of look inside, see what's going on and try to understand, you know, people who are lean or not very overweight, but have metabolically unhealthy phenotypes 
could be at greater risk. And so we have a whole series of potential, potential metabolic biomarkers. This has not been terribly thoroughly explored, although there is pretty good evidence for some of these. Um, to sort of understand this pathway and things you might look at, you know, a large number of different specific biomarkers and metabolic characteristics along the way. And so the goal is to develop lateral flow tests for some of these biomarkers uh, and then explore the possibility of using that in predicting and understanding the, the progression to obesity. Um, it's tightly interwoven between UH and tech. Um, people at tech, our medical collaborators, do a selection of biomarkers. Those turn out to be leptin, adiponectin, and insulin. They're the experts in that space. Then tech people at U of H and UH people at U of H and sometimes tech people at tech have been involved in design and development of the lateral flow. Um, we're also collaborating with um, the people in, in Mexico City and the National Institute of Nutrition to do biomarker determination by ELISA as gold standard comparison. Also, as a scientifically interesting thing to do. You can do a lot of biomarkers by ELISA. Then optimization and production of the, of the lateral flow tests, um, and those are coming along. And then there's clinical validation with lots of samples. Adult samples, we're in fairly good shape. Uh, human subjects permissions were already in place. Uh, permissions for children, research involving children, are obviously slower and harder to get, but we're moving along on that. So um, there are lots of things that one could do. The choice made by our clinical collaborators is leptin, adiponectin, and insulin. And there are a bunch of reasons to, to sort of rule in or rule out, right? We would like to have markers that are high enough concentration. We would love to have a marker that's always at high concentration and is starkly black and white, high and low, and you never get that, right? So we're going to need to do panels with some statistical combination thereof. But just to give you a calibration, here's leptin, and the ranges of interest are sort of, you know, in the, in the 5 to 20 to 10 to 20 kind of range of nanograms per mil, those are well in the detectable range. And we don't have to quantitate the very lowest levels, right? The intention is to have a cutoff here. Um, adiponectin actually presents a kind of a different problem. It's extraordinarily abundant, right? So one or three micrograms per mil, one or 3,000 nanograms per mil, which is a very large number and might call for using a conditioning diluent or being very careful about the, the lowering the sensitivity of the test. <clears throat> and then insulin, and all kinds of interest about insulin, it's usually expressed in, in units. Just remember, you know, normal fasting levels are less than say 15 micro international units and uh, insulinemia might be 80. So, you know, 15 to 80 are kind of the range that we're thinking about there. <clears throat> and so they look like standard lateral flows. Uh, this work was almost entirely done by Margarita, uh, mostly in my lab with a lot of assistance from people here. Um, and we try lots of antibodies. There's a lot of buffer optimization, which can be pretty boring. I'm trying to persuade my guys we need a robot for this. They're surprisingly resistant. Um, they'd rather get repetitive stress injuries, as far as I can tell. They like the craftsmanship of <clears throat> doing it themselves and having good control. Um, and I'm jumping over a million slides of things that, that have been done here. But, you know, if you want to sort of do some validation, this is what the lateral flows look like. And you just do a lot of strips. Um, so here's a dilution series, nanograms per mil. And to, to read these, this is the absorbent pad, right? Some, some of the detectors always end up there. You don't see this. Like in the little ones I handed out, there's a window that's here and there. You don't see this stuff. Okay, so ignore that. Then this is the control line, right? That always needs to be present to show that flow was good. And then this is a dilution series from 100 nanograms per mil down, 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 you know, to five, two and a half, one, et cetera. Software is better than the human eye, and seeing it directly is better than seeing it in PowerPoint, but, you know, I can see those 0.5s pretty well, um, even here. <clears throat> and then you always need to have some sort of a gold standard way of, of, of determining how, how well things are doing. So you can spike serum, you can deplete leptin out of things, you can do a gold standard ELISA and compare with that. The other thing you have to do is you can't do all this in buffer, right? Marvelous tests that work great in buffer collapse horribly when they see blood or serum or plasma, right? And so you have to be quite realistic about that. It's very difficult to run whole blood in a setting like this. 
we have to dilute and condition anyway in many cases, so we have some luxury there. We also are playing with two different readers here, one called the cube reactor reader, another one called Lumogenics. They agree quite nicely. <clears throat> um, more about insulin. Uh, I'm not going to go. Here's the here's the insulin results. You know, again, cube and and lumogenics, and um, yeah, it's in picomoles. Sorry, I actually should have shown a slide with the different units on it. Here's a dipinectin. Similar idea. Here's what things look like when we're testing with the the early the early testing is usually challenging with a a zero and a high, and what you're worried about is, for example. This antibody is giving a significant, um, a significant test line under under the wrong circumstances at zero. It's better here, right? This buffer has been optimized now. But the thing you can see is either a weak signal when you want a signal, or a, a high false positive signal when you don't want. And that's where all the optimization of buffers comes in, and it's where some antibodies crash out, and you have to try more and different combinations. So there really can be just a lot of screening effort involved here. Um, but a dipinectin is a very forgiving analyte because the concentrations are so high, and uh, that's that's working really well now. Um, let's see, is this yeah test line okay? That's fine. Um, so we are. I, I apologize. I actually dropped a slide that I had hoped was in there. We were cross calibrating against ELISA as a gold standard, and that's the thing I was looking for, not seeing. But you have to do some sort of a gold standard calibration. You have to worry here about endogenous levels of all of these things in your blood samples that you get. You have to worry about getting blood. Um, there are human subjects concerns. Um, in, in our setting, I can bleed. Uh, eventually, our human subjects people said that my senior people who have PhDs and have been around can bleed or spit. We do some saliva assays too. Um, but the best way for us is to go to a thing called the Gulf Coast Blood Center. It's the blood bank. You know, Texas Medical Center is a gigantic medical institution and that blood center has lots and lots of samples and they occasionally have one that is misfilled unwanted uh, it has extra they use most of it and then they save the leftovers and they'll give the leftovers to us uh, one thing that we learned a while ago was that blood is not the same as blood you know you think oh homeostasis blood is very well it's not true right i mean if you go and sample your blood and then go eat a big fatty meal and sample your blood again the cream rises to the top. I mean, you get really quite different blood chemistry uh, among people and even for a single human being over time. And you got your test has to be able to deal with all of those, right? So there really are, are a variety of biological variabilities you got to be realistic about. So this is the stage we're at now, optimization and making more of them. Um, this is, is this going to work? No, that doesn't, yeah, it does. So this is our BioDot device. It's running along. And it's it's striping antibodies. So when you see a commercial test, you know we can all take a pipetman and make a circular dot of a liquid on a strip. But you'll notice that the lateral flows all have these beautiful sharp, crisp lines, and that greatly increases sensitivity. Right? If you can concentrate all of your signal, all of your capture of the reporters in a very limited area, it stands out very sharply against the background. And so good striping, as they call it, is a big deal. It's also a very efficient way of making things. So this thing runs along and stripes. Typically for a card, we get 50 tests. You saw, I mean, that, that was most of the time to stripe such a card. So we can do an awful lot of them. If you really go to industrial manufacturing, you do it in a reel-to-reel -reel or roll-to-roll -roll way where things flow along continuously like a, an old cassette tape um, and they get striped as they go. And then we have drying ovens and we have the guillotine cutter for cutting things up, et cetera. So it's a great area, right? It's really a very satisfying area in which to work. We, uh, we enjoy a tremendous advantage over the therapeutics people because we can try our stuff on real humans, not on the humans, but on samples derived from real humans right away. Um, our stuff can be rolled out and commercialized, not as easily as you might imagine, but still much faster than a drug. Um, the, the knowledge of proteomics and genomics out there is getting better and better and better. So we have all kinds of targets that are emerging. We have a pretty good test for Rocky Mountain spotted fever right now with people in Galveston, courtesy of proteomic studies of the pathogen. And we're actually looking for collaborators. We're talking to somebody at one of the tech campuses actually to do some testing with that. Um, we have a brucellosis test that's currently in Africa in Cameroon right now. 
uh, the, the, the opportunities are large. And then the other thing that drives us in addition to sort of the wave in biology is the wave in microelectronics, right? So we might use our, our $1,000 smartphone, but I can with, you know, with its camera, et cetera, but we can also buy a smartphone camera capable of red, green, blue image splitting on a chip with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi for less than $4. FOB Shenzhen China in fairly large numbers, but not huge, not huge numbers, four bucks. Okay, but the other thing that the smartphone has is a brain, right? It can do all the numerical analysis. Well, Arduino or other similar chips, maybe $18, right? For a little computer that's perfectly capable of doing that analysis. And it's not even that you have to like do a lot of wire wrap and soldering and stuff. They come as modules. You can click them all together. You can 3D print the, the physical thing that holds stuff together. If you're really good, like the guy that I was referring to earlier, Bin Vu. Um, and then you can either buy a cheap um, LCD display and put it on there, or you can make it talk by Bluetooth to your smartphone. And people don't like using their smartphones with the icky, potentially infectious samples of strangers, right? Parents will do their children. Sure, yeah, okay, I'm gonna test my child for flu, for example, but they won't, they won't test lots of strangers' icky samples. And so making little freestanding readers, we've been doing a fair amount of that as well. Um, and I just reiterate what I said a minute ago, that you really have to pay attention to the, the end users, the customers, right? It's so easy, it's so common that technologists will come and say, I bring you fire. And say, oh, yeah, I'd rather have an LED light, right? <laughs> you know, it's a light source, it's not actually exactly doesn't fit, doesn't go in our workflow. There's no clinical actionability. Your false positive rate is too high. We do endless follow-ups for no good reason, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To really have a deep understanding uh, is, is not trivial, okay? People have to spend a lot of time together, preferably with coffee or even better alcohol over a long period of time. You know, I, I have a formal appointment at Baylor. U of H is building a medical school. I'm a member of the MD Anderson RNA Center. I'm a member of the Methodist Hospital Research Institute. I was on sabbatical at the UT McGovern Hospital, the medical school and, and hospitals last semester. Um, and there are still only a few areas where I actually think I understand the real clinical needs well enough to propose a technical solution, uh, which would actually be valuable. Then I have the problem of developing the technical solution, which is not guaranteed, right? So, you know, it's a big Venn diagram and it's hard to hit the overlap. And then the last thing I want to note is, you know, I've, I've been interacting with tech for a long time and I've never seen a more exciting time than here now. You know, the Faculty of Excellence, the growth in, in, the, in the medical school, the growth in engineering, uh, you know, winning, winning against some pretty difficult challenges on a national scale. Uh, it really is a remarkable place. And I'm quite proud to be a member of your community. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, uh, Richard. I think now is not what is the time. I want. So now is the time, not really for questions. For interaction. So, uh, any from the audience or from the virtual session, please. Theo. If I'm considered from the audience, that's, that's great. Definitely, I think definitely. this was a very nice presentation. I have a few reflections. So, you talk about blood samples, which is, of course, more difficult if you want to have it as a personalized, individualized medical approach. So are you considering also salivary samples, anterior chamber of the eye fluid samples, and teardrops? Because that will give a lot of potential for this home diagnostics. So as, as an expert in this space, you'll know what a Schirmer script is. Yeah. So Schirmer scripts are these pieces of absolute paper you can put against the eye. Mm -hmm. I have said them on my desk. You're a great guy. Mm -hmm. Full of American things, some settings that are responding. Tends to be easier to run that. The other, oh, the other reflection is I mean, obviously, you touched upon a huge worldwide problem with obesity and, and diabetes. And 
if you now look at the age where these diseases or, or states are coming, going down in, 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 in age, it's, it's tremendous problem. So my guess is that there will not be healthcare affordable for these individuals in the future, if not something drastic is done. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these samples, you, you had a number of so-called biomarkers. Do you think that you can get by using just one biomarker, or do you need to develop a ship where you have multiple biomarkers that you can analyze on the same sample simultaneously? I think absolutely option B. And I, I sort of referred to it briefly when I was talking about leptin. You know, leptin is interesting and highly relevant, but it's not a very great biomarker by itself. And so it's one reason I'm so excited about multiplexing. We have multiplexing for phosphorus too, although this green strontium eliminate is better. But for, uh, for many things, we have multiplexing abilities and, and panels I think are where it's gonna, gonna be without much doubt. For example, our, our lupus thing works quite well, but Chandra Mohan is very good at discovering biomarkers in this space and there are several other candidates and my guess is that an eventual clinical product will have more than one on it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. We have some questions from the virtual audience. Um, will the use of the multiple colors be feasible for quantitative approaches instead of multiplex in LFA? So that's a super interesting question. Um, you know, we talk about we talk about using multiple colors as um, a way of doing multiple analyze. But one of the things you can use one of the colors for is an internal reference standard. And we're quite interested in that. We have a molecular test where we're absolutely planning to do that, um, to do, say, a competitive PCR, a competitive isothermal application. And, and the general idea, I mean, many of you have seen this in analytical chemistry, is you, you want to measure something. So you have something, you have, a, you have a internal standard that's similar to that. Mass spec is the best example, where you make an isotope labeled version of some protein you're interested in, and you spike it in in a known concentration, let's say one picomolar. And then you do all of your sample prep, and maybe your triptych digestion, et cetera, et cetera. And then you fly that in the mass spec, and you get two peaks, right? You have the, the real authentic material that we'll say in the blood. And we do this for our Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever project. Um, and then you have nearby, chemically essentially identical, mass very close, but distinguishable by the mass spec, you have the carbon-13 or the deuterated version thereof, and you know the concentration you put in of the internal reference marker, and then you ratio the two, and you can get, you can get some calibration. And we contemplate certainly doing that for some of these things as well. Uh, quantitation is tough. We have to be careful about this. Thank you, Richard. Um, I will ask another question from the virtual audience while the people here at the room think about their lunch. <laughs> um, which type of sample will a better quality or quantity of biomarker be obtained for this type of diagnostic tests, blood, urine? So it depends extraordinarily on the nature of your problem. I mean, the reason we got into Shermer strips and, and blood tear fluid was that we were interested in measuring some of the eye mucins as, as um, measures of things like various forms of dry eye, uh, graft versus host disease, Sjogren syndrome, things of this sort. Um, and so that, that's an, an eye surface issue, you have to measure tears. Um, there are some biomarkers that sadly are only available in stool samples. We are, you know, the whole field has an ick factor and a giggle factor, right? especially for engineers, you know, now we're going to be talking about chlamydia or pregnancy tests or urine samples, right? Um, my group has not chosen to pursue any stool markers at this point, um, with one exception. Um, if, we, if we get to choose, from an analytical handling point of view, urine is best. It's well-behaved, runs well on lateral flow. Um, we ran into a real problem with the nasal swab extract, right? So during COVID times, there was a tremendous interest, desire, need, and sort of difficulty of getting samples from people who had COVID. And we wanted to test our lateral flow. And we had friends at the, at the, the hospitals run by the University of Texas Medical School near us. And we were able to go and get samples from the, from the ICU, people very, very sick with COVID. And they're lying there in the bed, you know, under, under human subjects' permissions. We could do one extra swab or even get the leftovers of the previous swab. 
Um, and then we could run that and, and check it. And we did pretty well, and we got very nice results. But it turns out snot matters because those people had nasal cannulas that were giving them oxygen and constantly drying out their noses. And when we sent it off to another site for validation, those people came in with horrible wet boogers and the character of their snot was different and it ran differently in the lateral flow. This caused us a significant problem actually. So, you know, the most low prestige, boring, why do I have to think about that? We have a glorious lateral, sorry, glorious molecular test that we're working on for something really important, which we can do all of the steps except the sample prep. It's the boring sample prep thing at the beginning that makes it go from being elegant and small with, you know, sort of, you know, this thing and one of these sticks and that's about it. And we can diagnose something really important around the whole world really cheap, except that sample prep is this giant object and we haven't gotten past that yet. Um, so uh, the question is a great one. Uh, it depends entirely on, on what you're looking for. We have our preferences, but sometimes we don't get to work on what we want to do. Thank you, Richard. Any question from the audience? Perhaps in order to motivate the audience, I will make a kind of a general question, Richard, and perhaps recommendation. You mentioned what is going on at tech at the moment about research and, and attracting talent. But perhaps something very important is that we need to focus. We need to be aggressive in selecting certain areas. Uh, you mentioned I know you from more than 20 years on the time of protein purification, bioengineering, and now we are in the area of diagnostic and early detection. Can you comment or can you talk a little bit about, I don't know what is the right word, but to focus or to choose areas of research, especially for the new comers, the new researchers, so I'll begin by telling my own story a little bit. So as I mentioned when I introduced myself, but most of you I think were not there um, yesterday, I, I happened to bumble into a giant societal problem when I started being a professor, which was that the molecular biologists had discovered how to cause microorganisms to produce incredibly valuable therapeutic proteins. Insulin was a famous example, right? There was going to be a worldwide shortage, a very large shortage of insulin, which was derived from pigs because the rate of diabetics, the, the number of diabetics was growing faster than the number of pigs that were raised for slaughter. And because the pig pancreas from which the insulin was made was a little byproduct, you couldn't afford to just raise pigs to make insulin. So, you know, imagine somebody who is or whose child is a brittle insulin dependent diabetic who suddenly learns they can't get their insulin. Then imagine hundreds of thousands of such people, right? That becomes a force that changes society, right? And fortunately, the molecular biologists figured out how to make this stuff. Um, and, you know, there were interesting possibilities there of averting this problem and developing the, the, heart, the heart attack drugs, you know, the plasminogen activators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there were no engineers to make this stuff because the biochemists could do purifications of proteins, but it's quite small scales. And the engineers could purify things, but not proteins. They could run distillation and, you know, organic solvent extraction and a bunch of techniques that weren't very applicable to proteins. Um, and so there was this felt need for people who knew about protein chromatography, aqueous two-phase, uh, and you know, just by, by sheer accident, I, I bumbled into that space. I also was quite interested in physical chemistry and the first few structures of, uh, crystal structures of antibodies complex with proteins came out around that time. And a collaborator I wanted to work with on molecular simulation was interested in those. I said, hey, antibodies, that's good. Area. Let's work on that. And so we got heavily in antibodies and we got heavily into sort of dealing with messy, complicated biological samples like E. coli lysate and stuff. And then, I mean, I've been a professor now for, this is my 36th year, right? So I've had time for some eras, not, not Taylor Swift eras, but some eras in my career. Um, and so I was very interested in antibodies. I knew a lot about antibody binding. Uh, we did a lot of immunoassay stuff. And I was comfortable with sort of the things that look like sample prep. And so we began poking at the diagnostic space. The NASA Johnson Space Center is the one that keeps the astronauts alive and worries about medical diagnostics, there are opportunities in that space. And then we have enormous numbers of medical complexes around us, uh, especially in this case, 
the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, which is the best university pathogens laboratory in the United States. So the only really effective therapies for Ebola, for example, were tested there with live Ebola by people wearing spacesuits, right? They're a serious pathogen lab. And I started inter interacting with them. And a guy named David Walker, a, a legendary pathologist in the US and, and rickettsiologist especially, appointed me theme lead for diagnostics of a thing called the NIH Western Regional Center of Excellence in Biodefense and Emerging Infectious Diseases, partly driven by the anthrax attacks of the early 2000s, partly by you know the idea that diseases would emerge, and boy, that turned out to be true. Um, and I was not competent to do the job, right? It was terrifying, terrifying. So I started buying all kinds of books on tropical medicine, <laughs> you know, learning about horrible you know, hemorrhagic fevers and spending a lot of time at Galveston. And, and, and being told by physicians and pathologists especially, well, that's kind of cool that you can do that, but we don't care. There's nothing clinically actionable about what you're proposing. Or, you know, I started reviewing proposals from my fellow engineers who had this wonderful technology, but you had to have a thousand kilogram magnet to make it work, and it just really wasn't going to happen. And so I, I gradually, through just pain and error, got better about it. And so that's now, of course, my other specialization. Um, I don't think there's a single thing that tech should specialize in, but I think the choices it's made for the moment are quite good, right? I mean, you know, you operate in a, in a national environment where, you know, by our standards, we have about 15 places we can pursue funding in the U.S. And in Mexico, you principally had Conocid, and it's become much, much less generous than it once was. Fortunately, as an elite, highly desired and moderately wealthy organization, tech can establish these institutes and pursue them. And if you're going to choose important things for the world and important things for Mexico and important things for tech, I think education and advanced manufacturing and sustainability and obesity are great choices. I mean, I might have come to similar choices myself. Now, the question I think you really want me to try to answer is the one I really can't do, which is what should individuals focus on? Um, I would say that sort of a defocusing de thing, a skill that technologists often lack is what people might call product market fit or customer validation or customer discovery. And I'm really gonna recommend this. I mean. I was involved in starting a company in Silicon Valley around 1999, and U of H has the number one undergraduate entrepreneurship program in the United States. Uh, Rice, our neighbors, has the number one graduate entrepreneurship program in the United States. So we have this education readily available, and I was suddenly involved in a startup, and I didn't really know anything about companies or startups. So I went and I, I took the Entrepreneurship 101 class uh, over there. I just sat on the floor with the students. Um, and then I started to take a marketing class. And technologists are ignorantly unkind to the business and marketing people sometimes. And I emphasize that it's ignorance. Uh, it's this phenomenon that people think that whatever they don't know about is easy. But I promise you, uh, it's very, very easy to make a cool technical object, uh, which maybe you think should be a company. But you know, a company that exists for very long somewhere has a customer who will actually give you money for the thing right the ultimate you know, don't say look i made a cool object do you love my object because they'll all say they do right much better is to say ah you you're in an area that i'm sort of thinking about trying to address the needs in. what are your problems and if they say this problem and that problem and that problem and they never mention the problem that you're solving uh, maybe your problem is not a real problem they'll pay to fix. If, on the other hand, they all say, I want glowing green rocks, I don't have enough glowing green rocks, that's a good sign, right? But you have to do it in a fair way where you don't say, do you love my baby, because they'll say that. And you also have to do it with, say, a hundred different relevant people so you run out of friends. Because your friends will always be nice to you, oh, your, beauty, your baby is so beautiful, right? But you want the people who don't care about you even better, the ones who are annoyed that you're bothering them and taking their time, say, oh, your baby's very ugly, right? Uh, you know, or they might say, well, I discovered that your baby is actually a chimpanzee, try the zoo, right? So that kind of pivot actually happens a lot, not with actual babies, but you know, there's a famous story in one of the i programs I attended where these guys had a robotic device and 
nobody seemed to want it. And then one of the annoyed, you know, non-friends around interview number 60 or 70 said, yeah, yeah, try the ag people. They might want the damn thing. And that is now a very successful agricultural robotics company, right? So technical and medical people too. Don't, don't be so, medical people are probably better because they're often actually the customers too. But, you know, don't be so arrogant as to believe that while you've checked all of your scientific and technical hypotheses really carefully with good research and data, don't believe that your random guess about who will want it doesn't require such checking and validation too, right? That's a hypothesis as well. And you actually got to pay attention to whether there's evidence to support that or just your, your gut say, oh, everybody will love my object. Maybe not, maybe not. Not a complete answer, but, but it's one of my favorite subjects because it's I mean, a huge gap. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. I mean, I think some of the ideas just came across. Uh, is there any other question from the audience? Uh, could you talk about the detection molecule? I mean, you talked only about antibodies, but I was wondering whether, I mean, why do you use antibodies? Such a big molecule is so difficult to make. I'm can, sure. Can you use something else? Sure, sure. And so let's assume for the moment that we just want a specific binder, right? And we don't, it doesn't have to do anything else, which is common in a test like this. So, um, I know the two groups that made aptamers, and we do some aptamers work. We've seen some horrible non-specificity aptamers, but a former student of mine named Bill Jackson runs the second best, I think the second best aptamers company in the US called Base Parrots in Houston. The best is Somalogic, and they have a tremendous proteomics platform. Um, that's out of Colorado, out of Larry Gold. Um, and we do that sometimes. Um, we have found that aptamers tend to be pretty context dependent. I mentioned that, that antibodies, for example, may work well on nitrocellular, so they may work on a polystyrene particle, and sometimes you can't switch them. We find that phenomenon to be very strong in the case of some aptamers, I think because they're small, right? Um, but where possible, we like them. And also aptamers have interesting possibilities of doing intramolecular floors and quenchers and dequench, and so we like those quite a lot. Um, not all antibodies have to be full-length IgGs. We've, we clone antibodies. We're doing one now. You can get antibodies protein sequenced for four or $5,000 now. If you've got 50 micrograms of an antibody and you want to make it recombinant, there are services now that will sequence the protein for you for, in our case, $4,000, which is amazingly cheap compared to the old days. And you can order the genes really cheap and have it made. Um, I will note, however, that in the very best practitioners, sort of the, the Roche genetics, and Novartis's of the world, the, the, the manufacturing cost of pharmaceutical grade antibodies, commonly in a Cho cell culture with a titer north of 10 grams per liter now, is less than $100 a gram. It's extraordinary. And that's pharmaceutical grade, not diagnostic grade. And so it's true, they're, they're expensive when you buy them. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of bad antibodies out there commercially available. But if you, for example, were going to scale something and make, you know, we were looking at buying large quantities of antibodies for some of the COVID stuff, for example, um, and you get into sort of the full real rock bottom, we're fully scaled kind of pricing. Um, there's such, I mean, there's this $200 billion industry that knows how to make pretty much IgG1s human from Cho. Uh, that all comes to bear on the problem. We have a, pr a different project in which we're using a receptor. Uh, we have a recombinant soluble form of a receptor, and that's quite nice. It's glycosylation sensitive, and we, we don't know of another way to do it. We're playing with lectins, but the receptor seems to be better. And the, the, the whole point of the thing we're measuring is to predict this product's interaction with the receptor. So it's sort of the most authentic test. So we like those. Um, we make other forms. We do SCFVs, recombinant fabs, et cetera. I have the feeling I'm missing at least one, but absolutely, other, other possibilities are certainly there. Yeah. Um, if there is not any other question from the audience, from virtual, we do not have, then I would like to uh, close the session. But before that, Richard, just um, take us adopted the phrase, the phrase of science in action. When you hear that, what do you think about what will get to your mind? 
so my, my wife and I have been coming to realize that we're Philistines. Um, we're, not, we're not very motivated by philosophical argument. We sometimes wish we were, right? That's the quintessential mark of a developed mind for 2,000 years. You should know philosophy, et cetera. And we just don't do it very well, okay? We're striving to be better, but we've failed utterly. So what do we get excited about? Well, you know, new knowledge. My wife is a, is a bioinformatician at the Baylor College of Medicine Human Genome Sequencing Center, right? So she'll have 70 terabytes of human DNA. Um, and she got written up in, the, in Texas Monthly, a pretty big magazine, for her work on, on adult intellectual disability. So these are, these are kids who were born, not, not kids anymore, but they were, when they were kids, genetic testing was unavailable, right? It was, sequencing was too expensive. You know, the price of DNA sequencing has declined by 10,000 fold in the last 20 years, right? From ridiculously prohibitively expensive to practically free, how are you gonna pay for the analysis, right? Um, and so she's sequencing these people who have lived in the shadows. Parents have been taking care of them. Uh, and the parents in almost every case have been on what they call the diagnostic odyssey where they've been to see many, many physicians and they blame themselves. The parents are tortured by guilt. Oh, I, uh, the air conditioning in the car broke and the baby got too hot or I dropped the baby once. And they, they think they did this to their child and they've been living for decades. Right? And they get a 50% a diagnostic yield rate by sequencing these people, it's extraordinary. In most cases, you can't do anything about it. It's too late, you know, it's early developmental, et cetera. But in every case, you get the possibility of understanding family dynamics and looking carefully to understand your future next generations, carrier status, that kind of stuff. And in every case, they lay down the burden of guilt. I mean, parents cry when they get these results. It's extraordinary. Um, that's a good example because it has this tremendous emotional resonance, but that's, that's science in action, right? I mean, humanity is made better. Individual humans are made better and happier by this action. And we aspire to do stuff like that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. As Luis mentioned, Perolov and Richard and Luis, they are part of our faculty, faculty of excellence, so they are with us there will be more than one opportunity to interact and to collaborate. For the time uh, right now, so I would like to close the, the session. Thank Richard and thank all of you for, for the attending. Thank you very much.